zero, the temperature will continue to rise. And so that's, that's a big challenge. It's very different than saying, you know, we're a 12 foot high truck trying to get under a 10 foot bridge and we can just sort of squeeze under. This is something that has to get to zero. And the prescribed solution was that everything had to be done to cut down on the amount of carbon dioxide that is released into the atmosphere. And there are two ways of doing it. One is population reduction. The second is the mask. I want to talk just very briefly about the energy policy or the suicidal energy policy that Great Britain has been pursuing now uh, for 15 years uh, and even longer. I was on the Environment Committee uh, in the European Union and I've never heard so much nonsense talked in all my life. There were 10,000 researchers in all for the European Parliament when I was there and I threw open, I threw open a challenge to all researchers of every political party in every country if they could show me any correlation between atmospheric carbon dioxide and temperature and weather. None could, simply because there is none. And this is why we haven't been able to debate this on mainstream TV, which is where most people get their information. There has been no serious debate. There has been plenty of people appearing on your TV screens. There have been celebrities, royals, actors and actresses, goodness knows, but very, very few independent scientists, and yet there are thousands of them, thousands of them who do not accept the hypothesis that man-made uh, carbon dioxide is going to cause some form of apocalyptic end to the planet. It's nonsense, and it's WEF-sponsored because it's about political control, because we are going into some sort of suicidal pact here in Great Britain over this subject with net zero. Net zero, which is absurd, impossible, unnecessary, and we're now tripling the number of wind turbines we're going to have, um, but three times FA is still FA. It's three times nothing. It's a waste of time. We've got um, solar panels now being distributed around Yorkshire. Yorkshire. Solar panels. You know, I love Yorkshire, but the sun don't shine here very much, to be brutally frank. Uh, it's absolute madness. So they keep blaming human beings for being the problem. They say that we're emitting so much carbon dioxide. Can they tell us how much carbon dioxide is already in the atmosphere and how much is required to be there? And how they measured it? Look, if, they, if we had definitive proof that CO2 was causing serious problems and we could prove it, don't you think they would write that down on a piece of paper somewhere so people could read it? They don't have definitive proof, period. The CO2 agenda is a hoax. There is no proof that carbon dioxide is causing earth warming. I'm, I'm a student of the philosophy and history of science, and I know that the scientific method has not been applied in such a way as to prove that carbon dioxide is causing the earth to warm. Do you think in a few years, say 50 years from now, people go, that was a really stupid period in our history when we tried to change all our energy policies to cut this gas? I am firmly of the belief that the future will show that this whole hysteria over climate change was a complete fabrication. What is causing climate change? Is it carbon dioxide? Uh Y yes, um, carbon dioxide pollution is a major contributor. Okay, so can I ask you, this is not a, a trick question, what percentage of the Earth's air is carbon dioxide? Oh, I don't know. And I say, hang on, you don't know what percentage of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide, and yet you're prepared to stand the economy on its head to address a problem, the detail of which you don't know. So when I then explain that the percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, Alice, is how much? Alice? How much of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? To answer Alice? the question, Scott Morrison has said he Al believes in climate much? change Alice, and that much? he wants to do something about Alice, it. Alice, how much carbon dioxide is the problem? How much carbon dioxide is there in the atmosphere? I'm not a scientist. I don't oh. know. I'm a well, hang on. If you're going to argue the case, you ought to know. It's 0.04 of a percent. 
And of that 0.04% human beings around the world create 3%. And of that 3%, Australia creates 1.3%. But if carbon dioxide is 0.04% of the atmosphere, and human beings are responsible for 3% of that 0.04%, and Australia is responsible for 1.3% of the 3% of the 0.04%, it's like saying there's a granule of sugar on the Harbour Bridge. Clean the bridge up, it's dirty. Surely if a political party doesn't know the quantum of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, what the hell are we standing the economy on its head for? Demonising coal-fired power, driving everyone into renewable energy, which is not available, not reliable and not affordable, plonking us in electric cars, giving us nearly the dearest electricity in the world when we're rich in energy resources, exporting coal so that China and India and Japan can have cheap electricity, and we sit here swallowing this ideological rubbish, putting industry at risk, jobs at risk, and burying the economy. It's all a fraud. If you ever thought that there'd been a fraud in the world, this is the biggest. So why are they going on with it? Because the only ones that can stop it is us. And that's why I'm talking to you. And we're going to stop these things. We're going to control them from the realm of the spirits. Because these are demonic activities. And by the way, they are already being crushed. Hallelujah. So you've heard it. It's a scam. The climate change scam. I want us to read from Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Yes. I want you to look at it again. And read it one more time. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Mighty through God. Through God. That means through the Holy Ghost. To the pulling down of strongholds. There are different kinds of strongholds. You remember in the When you read the book of Acts, chapter 16, and from verse 25, the Bible says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. <laughs> Hallelujah. With the weapons of our warfare, they brought down the prison house. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds. I want you to observe that that verse 4 is in parenthesis. Verse 4 in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, what we just read. Look at it again. You see, which means that he's basing what he's going to tell you on this truth. There's a truth here. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. These weapons were used 
throughout the scriptures. And so he's dealing with some of the kinds of strongholds, the different kinds of strongholds. And in dealing with these other kinds of strongholds that he lists here in verse, from verse 5, it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I want you to look at this from the Amplified Translation, the AMPC. Inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings like climate change. See that? It's telling you that we can use the weapons of our warfare to bring down these strongholds that they've planted in the minds of certain people. There are leaders who have been forced to believe this fallacy. There are children that have been led to believe this scam. There are young people, activists, who don't even know what they're acting about. They have no idea about the quantity of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. How much less what it requires to make it oversaturated or even to deplete it. They have no idea. But they're carrying placards and terrorizing others about climate change because they've been so deceived. Let me read that to you again from the New National Version. In verse 5, we demolish arguments and every pretension That sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Arguments. These are foolish arguments they've got. Foolish arguments. And it's all about money. If you followed the, the earlier part of the documentary, you'd have heard what those first speakers said. It's about huge sums of money. They say trillions of dollars involved in this, this scam. Lots of people have their jobs based on this. False researches. Huge businesses established on falsehood. heard what those first speakers said. It's about huge sums of money. They say trillions of dollars involved in this, this scam. Lots of people have their jobs based on this. False researches. Huge businesses established on falsehood. The problem is, it's destroying so many other people's lives, and it's based on eugenics, the desire to reduce world population selectively, where they determine who dies and who lives. And you heard, you heard that gentleman say that they want to drive it somewhat close to zero. He's not exaggerating because they say that the safest number of people 
To live on the earth is 500 million people. 500 million people. That's what they say. So they want to drive down the population from these billions of people around the world to 500 million to be safe. So he wasn't exaggerating when he said close to zero. And on that side of his equation, what was going to help to bring it down close to zero was P, people. That's what he thought. Because these are eugenicists. This is their game. And make no mistakes about it, that was what COVID was all about. It just failed. That's all. And that's what the vaccines are about. It failed. And they intend to come up again with those things. Because, you know, just like the devil, he, he, he doesn't give up like that. And the Bible shows us he's not going to give up until he's arrested and thrown in jail. First in the bottomless pit for one thousand years. After that, he would be out and sent to the lake of fire. Of course, he will have a, a little time to try to deceive the nations just one more time. And he'll do it. And then he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. So don't assume that they are doing this to save the planet. They're not trying to save the planet. They're trying to carry out their lifelong agenda. It's satanic. That's the problem. It's Satan's idea. It's a devil's idea. It's a devil's plan. I want to read another portion of the Bible to you, but we'll get into prayer. Visions chapter 6 from verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that he may be able to stand against the wires the stratagems, the gambits of the devil. It says, put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wires, trickery, travesty of the devil. Look at the next verse. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You see, it's not those guys who are talking. There are the real enemies. They're talking, but they're ignorant. They are deceiving, but being deceived. That's what the Bible says about them. It says deceiving and being deceived. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. There's a, there's a term you'd find in the Amplified Translation that's um, very instructive. Look at it. It says, for we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the despotisms. Despotisms. Why, why does he say so? Because, you see, when you, when you look at despots who run nations, the truth of the matter is, they themselves are being run by spirits, spirits of darkness. I want you to go to the book of Isaiah for a second. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. I want to read to you from verse 1 to verse 14. I want you to observe some significant truths. It says, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel 
and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. What a wonderful promise. Verse 3. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou was made to serve. But thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. See, when God blesses them with his freedom, okay, he says, thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon. And say, how hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. Notice what he calls him, the oppressor. We're talking about despotisms. The oppressor. The king of Babylon. How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. Next verse. The Lord had broken the staff of the wicked. And the scepter of the rulers. Remember, it's talking about this king of Babylon. All right. The oppressor. And it says, the Lord had broken the staff of the wicked. And the scepter of the rulers. With which they oppressed people. Next verse. He who smote the people in wrath. With a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger. Look at that. He ruled the nations in anger. It's persecuted and non hindered See, he's, we can understand he's dealing with the king of Babylon. Okay? And those who are allied with him. Look at the next. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. The brick fought into singing. Yet the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no fellow is come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stir up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It had raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Are thou also become weak as we? Are thou become like unto us? Because the king of Babylon has been defeated, right? Okay, but let's keep reading. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy virus, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou caught down to the ground, which this weak in the nations? Now, by the way, the word translated Lucifer there really means Day star, okay? Day star or morning star. So, uh, because in a, in a Christian um, community, we know who Lucifer is. That's the devil, all right? That's the devil. But let's, for the moment, not translate it and leave it as it was originally placed there, okay? And say, they start. Coming from verse one that we've been talking about, this uh, blessing to Jacob and then the, the king of Babylon. So in context, he's still dealing with the king of Babylon. And then he comes here in the 12th verse and says, how art thou fallen from heaven? Oh, Morning star or day star, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which this weaken the nations? See, the king of Babylon did weaken the nations. But what do we see here? We see he's dealing with the spirit being, and that's why the Vulgate translators decided the word Lucifer should be there to help understand a difference here. That is no longer dealing with a man. How are they fallen from heaven? He calls him son of the morning. How are they caught down to the ground which this weakened the nations? Look at the next verse. 
For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the size of the north. Okay. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So surely this is Satan. So here it's easy to understand that Satan was behind the character of the king of Babylon. So Satan is the real oppressor behind that man who oppressed nations, who weakened nations. He was just carrying out the actions he was exhibiting what he was inspired to do by a spirit being that was behind him. And that's exactly what the Bible tells us will happen with the Antichrist. It says Satan gave him his power. It was Satan who empowered him and led him to do the things that he did. So here in that verse where we we're reading, Ephesians chapter 6, that's the, uh, the 12th verse. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. The MPC says despotisms. So these are not just mere principalities in a general sense, because principalities can be positive and negative, but these are evil forces of darkness. Evil forces of darkness. And it says, but against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness. World rulers of this present darkness. So the people who are leading nations and cities in the darkness, leading communities into darkness, are inspired by these master spirits. World rulers of these present darkness. It says against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural sphere. In the heavenly realms. Thanks be unto God, the Lord Jesus Christ gave us power over all devils. All devils. And he said these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. He has a name that is above every name. Hallelujah. Now go back to that King James translation for a second. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. 14th verse. Stand therefore, having your loins guard about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. The shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench. Quench. All the fiery darts. Belos, that means missiles. Missiles, fiery missiles, flaming missiles of the wicked. But he tells us, we shall be able to look at, look at it. Go back to, he says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able. Oh, thank you, Lord. He says, with the shield of faith. That means your faith is a shield. See, your faith is a shield. And with that faith that you have, you shall be able to neutralize, put out. Quench all the fiery missiles of the wicked. Doesn't matter from where they are thrown against you. Hallelujah. We can neutralize them. Our faith is powerful enough to neutralize them. Our faith is a shield. Hallelujah. With which we shall be able to quench. 
put out the flaming missiles of the wicked. Glory be to God. And we are putting our faith to work today. Look at the next verse. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirits, which is the word of God, the rhema of God. The rhema of God. Words uttered from our lips in faith. Declarations from our lips. It says that is the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit which is. Hallelujah. The rhema of God. You know I told you rhema if you. In the, in the New Testament, the word rhema, that's translated word, is never used for God talking. Never. It's only used for the word of God spoken by men. Yes. So where it says, which is the word of God, is talking about God's word as spoken by you. As spoken by you. So it doesn't mean scripture. It's until you speak it. When you say it, it's the sword of the spirit, the rhema of God. Hallelujah. We're going to utter words. We're going to utter words. See, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And in the realm of the spirit, we're bringing down that force or that scam of climate change, the climate change scam. It's time to bring it down. We destroy it, and then we fill the world with truth. Yeah. So get ready now. We're going to pray. So wherever you are around the world today, let's pray. The nations will no longer be deceived by this scam. No longer. The children will not be deceived in the schools. They've, they've, they've uttered books and books and books on this fallacy. And now, those things will go to the winds. Let's pray. Open your mouth and pray. The climate change scam is over. Is over. Makaraba kasonda la bagasia. Lipa karabaga se tekele mahai. Mondorobo si karabaga seya. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And these mental strongholds in the minds of many are being brought down, turned down today. Sonda lo grozisko prati lege sota le braso kotori makasi lo ngro doste paragati la baha sakura bagasa tara bagasi keke bo soto kononte kia zara kapa kase te kepe ke soto konose ti sonda la bara bara bage de lege bo sata kala mani. so, Rakata Rabaka Sakara, 
Masote, Rogoba, you broke his brogira cosa to Parina Masula Hata, Masigo Brand, Gadila Hasne Karekoshe, Rabore Kose to Preketo Boro, Turakira Osotila Makrika, Larika Fraso Prakota Patelego de Dolegora Kina Mosa Prat, Jubrekira Kusa Turakira Maha, Masaka Prakatala Bashaya, Montekebo Bosho Prekebo Pakatea, Raba Satala Bashakabai. Marico breaking the boko se prekita. Mi breaking the boko shika pare. Marico breaking the boko saya. Ya, gare. La nagara pa. Sora da pa ba ya ka. Dari <laughs> Le bras, 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 le bras
eternal life thank you the whole world is yours all the nations belong to you everything you send us as a light to the nations to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth the salvation of men and you want them Say. That's why blood was shed for them, for the remission of sins. Thank you, thank you, Lord. And we will not let Satan destroy their lives. Liberty, the truth of God's love. No basaka raba kandelege bosida, lipa karaba kasetege. Deception will not prevail. But your truth resounded around the world. The gospel of righteousness. The gospel of salvation. The blessed gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Santo Cora Sibla Kalila Rondo Gabradiga Sales. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The climate hoax is defeated in the name of the Lord Jesus. It is defeated. Because they've tried to use it to control nations, to control men's lives, and even to destroy them. We will not allow it. Thank you. Thank you. The deception is exposed and destroyed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Taka paraba kunto kose le mandegia, li para kasande gebro Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Did you know that those claims, those climate change claims, have been used? in certain budgets of nations. They've been used in crafting laws and regulations in many countries. So that practically, that practically run the lives of many nations. 
with false claims on climate change. In fact, one of the foolish things they did some, some time ago last year, they, they said that a lady in Canada was diagnosed with climate change. That was terrible. That was a diagnosis. Climate change. What a doctor was that? What, what kind of a doctor was that? You see, they capitalize and feed on the, on the ignorance of men, which they create. True disinformation. But the Holy Spirit has been poured out. Remember, on the day of Pentecost, he was poured out on the whole world. He said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He said, the promise is unto you and to your children. And to those that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. So the spirit was poured out upon the whole world. The spirit of truth. So that men can recognize the truth of God when they hear it. And they can believe. So this ministry of the Holy Ghost is all over the world. They can hear God's truth and believe it and act on it for their salvation. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to invite someone very special to us. In, in the last one week, We've been listening to him. And of course, the whole team that have been sharing God's word with us. If you participated in the praise of thought, you would you would know what I'm talking about. But if you didn't, I feel sorry for you. And I'm hoping that you catch the rebroadcast. What I've got here a dear, dear friend, minister of the gospel, Dr. Mike Smalley. And I always tell them he's not small at all. I love you. I love you Come too. Come share sir. God's word with us. Praise the, Lord. Praise the Lord. How many are in love with Jesus today? How many are glad that he's in love with you? Oh, praise God. Thank you, our dear man of God. What an honor to be here and to be here on this special weekend in this time when not only did we have praise a thon, but we were able to have to be with you for the prayer day that we're here and, and last night and tonight. Some of the others had to go on earlier, and I'm so thankful for that. How many of you know that we all collectively, globally, need to increase our daily intercession and prayer for our man of God, Pastor Chris, as the Holy Spirit leads him in what he is doing on the earth and as we continue to stand with him like I think of it all the time as uh, Aaron and her were holding up the hands of Moses. So we can do that through our, our giving and our praying and continually standing with our man of God so that the Holy Spirit continues to just use all of us mightily as we bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Amen. And as I look around behind me, boy, it's uh, sometimes when I travel and preach, I turn around and I don't really know what I think about the people behind me, but when I come here, I know who's behind me, and I love all of you so much. It's a privilege. Thank you, Pastor Chris and Dr. Evans, and all of the distinguished men and women behind me. I was thinking as we were worshiping a minute ago and we were singing, it brought me back, and Pastor had mentioned the word joy a moment ago, and I want to teach you just for a few minutes a little something that's encouraged me through the years in regard to joy, and it reminded me of a scripture, if you would put up on the screen for me, John 17, 3. And I was thinking about my mom this morning. My mother is a uh, voracious reader. And as a boy, I grew up watching how much she and her father, my grandfather, read books continually. And out of that came a real love of reading for myself. 
and I began to read at an early age. And someone gave me a copy when I was about 18 of a book called Why Revival Tarries by a man named Leonard Ravenhill. And it really shook me up. And I took the book to my pastor. And I've tried many times to remember how did I even come across the book, but I don't remember now. But it, it really shook me to my core. And I went to my pastor and I said, have you ever heard of this guy, Leonard Ravenhill? And of course he had. And I told him what the book had done for me. And he said, you realize he just lives an hour and a half down the road. Well, I had no idea he was still alive, but that's all it took. So I, I back then there was, a, you could call an operator and get people's numbers. So I called and I thought this guy's number's unlisted for sure. But sure enough, they had a Leonard Ravenhill in Garden Valley, Texas. And I called and an older British man answered the phone. It was Brother Ravenhill. And I was able to schedule a meeting with him. And I went to see him for the first time September the 20th, 1988. I was 20 years of age. And as I sat there, he, handed, he gave me a, a, some books, but he had a list of books that he recommended every preacher read, like 50 of them. And so I began to go down the books. And one of them I want to recommend to you today, it'll, it'll really shake you up in a good way. It's an unusual book you probably won't ever hear about again, but it's called Fair Sunshine, F-A-I-R, Fair Sunshine by a man named Jock, J-O-C-K, Jock Purvis. It's a book about people in Scotland in the 1500s who were murdered or martyred, executed for their faith because they wouldn't renounce Christ and jump over into the Church of England. And so uh, it's a, each chapter is a biography of different people and their life. And, and the, some of them were tortured. And it's kind of like a Fox's Book of Martyrs, but it's about Scottish people. And in one of the chapters, a man was put to death. His name was Archibald Campbell. And they had a copy of a letter that he wrote to his granddaughter on the day of his execution. And it's very powerful. And in John 17, verse 3, we put that back on the screen. Let me read this to you and then give you this quote. Jesus said this, And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So Jesus gave us the definition there of life eternal, it's not just that you don't ever die. It's not just refusing to cease to exist. He's showing you that it's something deeper. It's the ability to actually know God, not just know about God. It's a big difference between knowing the Word of God and knowing the God in the Word. And tomorrow's Easter Sunday all across the United States and Texas where I'm headed. People go to church all over the area who don't normally go to church. Every pastor knows Easter and Mother's Day, these people show up, they won't be back again, etc. Many of them could quote Scripture. They know parts of the Word of God, but they don't know God. I have a, a precious cousin who's a, is an atheist, and he has a, a podcast and a national, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, a, a very famous person in the United States, and, and he's an atheist, but he, he loves to make fun of the Bible and make fun of Jesus and debate Christians and all these kinds of things, but he was baptized once in a church. And so my question for him was, was, he said, I used to be a Christian. Well, when you were a Christian, did you know God? Because if you tell me you did, then how can you be an atheist if you knew God then? And if you tell me you were a Christian but you never knew God, I tell you, you never were born again to begin with. Is the, the thing about Christianity is we're not just embracing an ideology. We get to meet the God who is living in us and who saves us, and we then get to use his name and have authority over everything on the earth that we set our voice to. It's a wonderful thing, this knowing God. And the more you get to know God, just like you do a, a person, you find out things about them. And the Bible talks about in Galatians, one of the fruits of walking with him is love and joy. And one of the things you want to know about joy is that it's, of course, the joy of the Lord is our what? It's our strength. But when you look at your life, and we're talking about prayer day and praying for the nations, and as an evangelist and someone that travels full time, I've been preaching 42 years this July, and we've just been preaching full time and traveling and, and all that we do. But I have three children. And if you were to say to me, Mike, would you like to travel the rest of your life all around the world but lose your own kids? I would tell you a big no. I want my family to be saved, and praise God they are. But I want us to pray in just a few minutes for everyone that we know and love who does not yet know and love God. I want us to spend some moments praying for the people you love the most.
to fall in love with Jesus the most. Some of you have nieces, nephews, next door neighbors, best friends from your school, maybe your own children. I wrote a book years ago called Reaching Your Grown Children for Christ. And I wrote it out of a broken heart because as I was traveling, people in their 70s and their 80s were walking up to me after service crying. And they would say, Mike, I raised my children in church, but now they don't care. They've left the church many years ago. They've left their faith. I don't have authority over them anymore. I can't choose their friends. I can't make them come home at you know a certain time. They don't live with me anymore. I don't know what I can do. Uh, how do I reach a grown son or daughter for Christ? And there were some that said, I didn't get saved myself till I was 40 or 50 and my kids were half raised. Mike, how do I go back and give my kids the gospel? And I began to dive into the scripture and see there were principles for God to give us something that brings us supreme joy, which is not just to see other people we've never met be born again, but the people we know and love the most coming to know Jesus Christ. And boy, is our joy full then when we then go with our family to reach out to the nations as well. Are you hearing my heart today? So this Archibald Campbell is being executed because he won't renounce Jesus in the way you and I know him, and he's being executed, beheaded that afternoon. And in this book, Brother Ravenel told me to read, he has a letter that he wrote to his granddaughter, the lady Sophia. And there was one sentence, the last, he's, he's telling her goodbye. He's, he's going to be executed that day. And the last sentence of that letter shook me to the core when I thought about this man who's sitting in a jail cell in Scotland in the 1500s and he's writing a goodbye letter to his granddaughter. He knows he's a physical dead man and he's not dying in his sleep in a peaceful way or something relaxing. He's going to get his head cut off and they're probably going to push him around and beat him up between here and the, 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 the place where they cut his head off. And this is what he says. He's writing a little letter to her goodbye, has some specifics and then he just says this. He said, the only thing I can wish for you, granddaughter, is that you may have as much joy in your staying in the world as I have today in my leaving it. And boy, did that hit me. My prayer for you is that you have as much joy as you keep living in the world as I have today when I'm getting out of it. This is a man who knew God. He knew God. He knew his day was up. But he said to his granddaughter, here's what I'd wish for you. I wish you could walk the rest of your life with as much joy as you live here as I have in getting ready to leave. The man they killed before him, it said, was walking up the steps of his execution block. And every stair that he climbed, he would say out loud, one more step closer to you, Jesus. One more step closer to you, Jesus. One more step. These are people who knew God. And Jesus said, this is what life eternal is. It's knowing God. And, and he made it possible to his death on the cross and his resurrection. He's made it possible for us to know this God. Oh, I'll never forget it years ago. i just tell you one last story. Brother Ravenhill was sitting in a room with me, and a man came in. He was an attorney, and he was one of those men who, who was trying too hard to impress of the people, including Brother Ravenhill. He should have just sat and listened. Sometimes you see people don't discern a room. They try to change and influence it too fast. He came in, sat down next to Brother Ravenhill. This is Brother Leonard Ravenhill. He's sitting right next to him. He says, Brother Ravenhill, I just drove in in a brand new Corvette. Got it parked right outside. I'm an attorney. Top of my graduating class. And he said, I make a lot of money. And he told him how much. And then he, then he shook his watch. He said, take this watch, for instance. I paid $150,000 for this watch. But none of it means a thing. I could get rid of all of it right now. And Brother Ravenhill, just like that, went. <laughs> he just held out his hand. I, I'd like your watch. And Brother Raven was British. He didn't laugh. He was real this dry. So he just puts his hand out. So I'd, I'd like your watch. And the guy began to laugh nervously. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Brother Raven just, he wouldn't move. He just kept his hand right there. Now, Brother Raven didn't want his watch. He wanted to make a point that the man could not do what he said. So he held it there. I'll take your watch. You just said you could get rid of it in half a second. I, I don't understand the problem. And then finally, Brother Raven just stopped. And put his finger right in the man's face and he says, do you know God? He said, you've told me everything you've done. I just want to know, do you know God? Do you know God? And the man crumbled because he put his trust in a lot of other things. Nothing wrong with Rolexes and nice things. We all know that. But it's a burning question to all of us. Do the people we love the most 
love him the most? Do the people in my inner circle? Years ago, I was coming to Africa here. I was going to Ghana actually to preach. And I got in the, on the plane in London. It's never happened before or since, but I was walking to my seat, looking at the number to where am I at. And I saw where it was going to be about from here to Reverend Tom was a girl who was going to be sitting next to me. And as soon as I saw her, the Holy Spirit said to me, almost as loud as I'm talking to you now, she's ready to accept Christ. I'd never had that happen before or since, but it was almost like everybody on the plane could have heard it, but I could tell nobody did. And I thought, well, Lord, I, I got a six-hour flight. I was leaving London flying to Accra. I can't just walk up to her and just say, hey, I, just, you, I got to have some entry points, you know. Jesus started in the natural and swung it to the spiritual. Talked about farming, fishing, lost coins, and then swung it right to where people really needed to hear. So, long story short, I knew I had six hours, but over the course of time, began to dialogue with her, find out about her life, and I gave her the gospel. And that's all I said, just thanks for listening. And I turned and picked up a magazine to see what she would do. And about 30 seconds went by, and her hand reached across and grabbed mine. And she said, my God, Mike, she said, don't leave me there. If what you said is true, I'm lost. How do I get to know the Jesus you just talked about? And I led her to Christ right there in 35,000 feet. Went to Ghana, went out and preached some crusades, did all the stuff, had the, the many people say, people healed, all that. And I'm walking off the platform to go to my car. And as I'm going to my car, it's the last day, the last night. I'm hot, sweaty, I'm ready to go home. And I'm walking to the car, and they're turning off the lights for our crusade. It's all outdoors. And a young man's voice comes from the darkness behind the platform, starts screaming and broken. I think he spoke uh, tree in, in Ghanaian there. And he's, he's got broken. He says, is he still here? And I thought he's talking about one of his friends, so I ignore it, and I'm going to my car. And this kid comes running through the bushes, and he's got thorns He's bleeding, he's been running through stuff, and he screams, is it too late, is it too late, is he still here? So he runs right to my car, and I grab him, I said, son, can I help you? He says, he didn't realize from my voice it had been me that had been preaching that night, but we had put our speakers facing north, south, east, and west, so anybody that was within two miles had to hear whether they wanted to or not. And so he says, I was back working. I was hoeing in a garden. And I heard somebody talk about a man named Jesus who has more power than the witch doctors, who can raise the dead and heal the sick and who can give eternal life. And then he said, if you'd like to meet Jesus, he's here tonight. You can come and meet him. He said, I dropped all my tools, but I've been jumping over fences and property lines. And I just got here and you're turning off lights. And I just want to know, has he left yet? Is he still here? He thought he was actually physically there. Boy, what a joy it was to tell him what I really meant. And we led that young man to Christ, 17 years of age right there before we got in now when I got in the car to leave and I'm leaning my head back all of you preachers know that moment when you're just tired but it's a good tired a lot of people say they want to live a full life not me I want to live I want to live and I want to pour out when I when I go to heaven I want to be able to tell the Lord I, I didn't keep anything inside whatever you put in here I just I, I emptied it out And as I put my head back, the Holy Spirit showed back up in the taxi again, the car. And he said, you thought you came here to Ghana to preach to the masses. And he said, I know you did. But he said, I arranged two divine appointments for you, one at the beginning of your trip and one at the end. To remind you that the most important thing is always the one person standing in front of you who does not yet know me. What really turned my heart to continually praying as I walk around, who am I going to bump into today? That one at the counter, the clerk, the waitress. You can't talk to everybody for four hours, but God knows who just needs one sentence, one word, one moment, one prayer, one discernment, one, one instant. You just, somebody have a migraine. Oh, you look like your head is hurting. Could I pray? There's so many ways to do it. But I want us to intercede tonight for the people we love the most that they would come into this place, Jesus said, that life eternal was knowing God. That we could move past the knowing one, two, three catechisms about God, but that we know God. That's what makes you unshakable. When somebody comes in and says, well, science has discovered this, or science, my cousin loves to talk about science. I said, you believe in science. And the most scientific impossibility ever is that absolutely nothing one day created absolutely everything. That's the most unscientific thing ever. I just believe in the beginning, God, and if you can get past those four, four words in the Bible, you got the whole thing kept. In the beginning, God. That's it. That's all I got to know. I can figure the rest out later. In the beginning, God. And I want to know that God. Do you believe it today? Oh, I believe it. Come on, stand to your feet all over this place today. And I want us to pray. I want us to spend some time in intercession 
for those we love who don't yet know God, our family, our friends. And here's what Jesus told us to do. He didn't tell us to pray that people be saved. There's no scripture in the Bible to pray people be saved. He said, ask the Father to send out laborers into the field. Because Romans 1.16 says the gospel was the power of God unto salvation. How can they believe if they haven't heard? So if they hear, the word of the Lord has an effect. So you want to begin to pray that the Father would send out harvesters and laborers into the field of the people you know and love. Your children, your parents, your grandparents, your next door neighbor, the kids you went to school with. The one lady that owns the dry cleaners you go into every single week. You have a relationship with her in that business sense, but you don't really know her, but you know she's not born again yet. So intercession for her. So we begin to pray that God would send out. Here's what you need to know about your family. And sometimes God, God, it's all preachers know this. You preach to audiences all over the world. I've had people fly many, many long way to come hear me preach. And I have relatives that live 20 minutes away who've never heard me preach one time. Not one time. So it's, it's a principle. Jesus said the prophets without honor except where? In his own family. So you need, or you wouldn't enjoy that person. You wouldn't receive from them very easily, but the person you're praying for can and will. So just say, Father, whoever you need to send, whoever it has to be, send out somebody you trust to reach the people I love the most. And trust the Holy Spirit. He wants people you love to be born again more than you do. So say, Holy Spirit, I'm willing to pray and ask you now. Second is, as Pastor Chris mentioned to us a moment ago, we have the authority to take authority, captive thoughts. So begin to pray over the mindset of the people that you love, pulling down strongholds in their mind, false reasonings, false belief systems. Use your authority as an auntie or an uncle or just a child of God and begin to call people's names out and say, I cast down every stronghold of wrong reasoning in their mind. False reasoning in their philosophy. I nullify it. I expose it for the air that it is. See, Satan never showed up in the Garden of Eden until there were two people because he came to be the third voice. He always comes to be the third voice. So you begin to nullify through intercession the third voice. It could be a disease. It could be a belief system. It could be a friend. It could be demonic. Who's the third voice in the person's life you're praying for? So number one, we're going to pray for harvesters and laborers. Number two, we're praying, taking authority over their thoughts. And number three, just very, very simple. We're praying that the will of the Lord be done in their spirit. Well, when you pray that, you know what God's will is in their spirits, that they're born again. Could we lift both hands right now? And all over the world, watching me on television right here, let's launch into a season of prayer and pray for those that we actually know personally that every member of our bloodline would be born again in the name of Jesus. Come on, lift up your voice right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we segment this portion of our prayer time for those we love who don't yet love you. Our nieces, our nephews, spouses, grandchildren, aunties, uncles, stepbrothers, stepsisters, friends from school, thrust out harvesters and laborers into the field. I decree my bloodline shall know God. Every member of my family in love with Jesus. Just pray boldly in the Holy Ghost right there at your house. Right here in the studio. Let let that innermost being of intercession flow out of you. He loves those you love more than you do. Father, that would be real joy. That would be some super joy for us. That everybody we love, love you. Everybody we love, know you. Increase our joy. Rondo robo si caraba se te she. Bondala si caraba si corobo se. Atalaba se. 
In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thrust out, Father. Send out harvesters and laborers into our immediate field tonight. We nullify the third voice. We break its power. We break its influence. We break its voice. We break its authority. We cast you out and cut you off in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, we cast down every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring an awakening to those we love. Let them see their need of your forgiveness. Then, Holy Spirit, draw them through a place of conviction to a place of calling on the name of the Lord. I decree our bloodline shall be saved. I decree every member of our family born again, sitting at the table of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Shakabrose. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Oh, Father, we're going to go and tell all the world, but we're going to tell our family. Oh, Father, as we stretch our hand out toward this world map, some of our families are scattered all over the world. We pray for our bloodline, all to be born again, all to be born again. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we pray to know our God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we decree, Father. We decree testimonies from this very room in the next 30 days. People born again, born again that we prayed for for years. In the next 30 days, there'll be testimonies out of this room. There'll be testimonies from the audience watching all over the world. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead and thank Him. Thank Him for answers to these prayers. Thank Him. Thank Him by yourself. Unto you we lift our voice. Thank him. Glorify his name. You may be seated.
faithful and just, you're righteous and pure. That's who you are. We glorify you, Lord. Yes, Lord, it's all to you. We lift our voice. You, Holy Lord. Precious Lamb. Most loved one. Lord, you are gracious. Unto you, a
Yes, you're holy, Lord. You're holy. Righteous. Gracious. I'm taking the brush at the you are worthy, Lord, all our praise, O oh God. Yes, Lord, you are worthy, Lord, all our praise, O oh God. Lord, you are worthy, Lord, you are worthy, Lord.
On all occasions, he says. Pray in the Spirit. On all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. And then it says, with this in mind, be alert and he says, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Now, before I give any further explanation, I want you to go to the Amplified Bible, not the MPC, the, the other one, Amplified Bible. With all prayer and petition, pray with specific requests at all times. On every occasion and in every season, in the spirit. And with this in view, stay alert with all perseverance and petition. Pretty much like what you just saw in the NIV. With all prayer and petition, pray. The petition there, he's explaining in parenthesis with specific requests. At all times. He tells you what it means by at all times. It means on every occasion and in every season. And with this in view, stay alert with all perseverance and petition. And he calls it interceding in prayer for all God's people. Now you're going to look at one more. Now maybe two more. Go to the NLT. New Living Translation. He says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. See how important it is for us to pray for all God's people. He says, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere everywhere you know we talk about praying for the nations and that's important and their leaders we looked at that yesterday but here he's talking about praying for the saints for fellow Christians he says for all believers everywhere says for us to be persistent in our prayers for them. Persistent in our prayers for them. Now go to the RSV. He says, pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. For all the saints. Pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer. What he's saying is this. Imagine if a uh, a medical doctor gave you a prescription and he said to you, with every meal, take this pill that the apostles did. At least with Paul, because he's writing this to the Ephesian church. So every time he wanted to stand in as well. If he was interceding for somebody, he prayed in the spirit, then he prayed in his understanding. You, you can understand it. Go to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 14. You're going to get it. From verse, let's begin from verse 13. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. 
For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. That's what it means. Pray in the spirit. See, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit or in the spirit. And I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit. The understanding is the also. But a lot of people have it backwards. See, they pray with their understanding most of the time. And then every once in a while, they pray in the spirit. But you will never get as far in prayer. with your understanding as you will with the Spirit. So he gives you that as, as priority. Turn that camera on. Who's, who's, who's on the console? Do a better job. He says, I'll pray with the Spirit, and I'll pray with the understanding also. I'll sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding also. Prioritize praying in the spirit. Praying in the spirit. You can get very far praying in the spirit. You can touch areas unknown to the human mind. Praying in the spirit. If you would go to Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 from verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray, or pray for as we ought. See, we don't know what we should pray for as we ought. In other words, we don't know how exactly to deal with that case. What are the details? We don't know. But, not as I ought to know. May not have the details. See? But the Spirit, all King James translation says itself, himself. Look at the new, new King James Version. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we are. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Groanings. Here's a different kind of prayer. But it comes out of your spirit through the Holy Ghost. Groanings. Deep sighs. This is different from speaking in tongues. Because in speaking in tongues, you've got utterance. The Bible says you're given utterance by the Spirit. In this case, you don't have utterance. It says groanings which cannot be uttered. So you find yourself... You're go <laughs> Sometimes you're crying. You say, I don't know why I'm crying. Sometimes you're deep sighs. You don't know why. See, but that's coming from your spirit. Since the spirit himself makes intercession. Intercession. He's specific about this kind of prayer. The spirit makes intercession. The Holy Ghost makes intercession. Through your spirit because it lives in you. What's he doing it for? It's for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. See, many times the Christians who get into the situation. Where they shouldn't have been. Had to pray like this. Says the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings. 
which cannot be uttered. Look at the next verse. Now he knows what the mind of the spirit is. He knows what the mind of the spirit is with all of that groaning. With all of those deep sighs. You don't know. You're not aware. You don't know. But the spirit knows. And the only way you could know is if he gave you that information in your spirit. It says because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. See, he knows the will of God. The Bible says, no man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. See, the spirit of God knows the things of God. He knows the will of the Father. He knows what God wants for you specifically. He knows the direction in which he is. He's dealing with our limitations in prayer. See, he props us up. He holds together with us in prayer. When that happens, you are assured of victory. You are assured of victory. You'd see it. This is the 27th verse. Never forget it. You'd see it now. It says, now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints. He makes intercession. Remember, he told us to pray always, right? For the saints. We just saw that in the visions, right? Chapter 6, verse 18, reading uh, the, the, the letter of Paul. And now here he says the same thing to the Romans. But he breaks it down this time. In the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. You see it? This is the ministry of the Holy Ghost in your life. And the Father who sees the heart, who searches the heart, knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Look at what follows. The word translated and didn't have to be translated and. It should have been translated now. See? But it's okay. The reason is just because of the, the full stop that they put there. If they were going to put full stop there, which was not originally there, then they don't have connected it properly with now. But um, haven't put it there. Yeah, it should be now. If it were not there, and will be appropriate. Okay, that's not a problem. It's not a big problem, right? So I'm going to read it again from 27 and then get into 28. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together. Hallelujah. So all things work together for good. You see, meaning no matter what the situation is, no matter what's happening, no matter what, if we pray the way we're supposed to be praying, if the Spirit bears us up in our weaknesses, 
And he prays through us with those groanings that cannot be uttered. That we make intercession by the Spirit. We know that all things work together no matter what. It's going to turn out for our good. Look at it. We know that all things, not some things, all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are the called according to his purpose. Because he called us in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Every one of us. All things work together for good. We cannot be disadvantaged. Never, never. No disadvantage to the child of God. No disadvantage to the child of God. You see it? What a life is given us. Thanks be unto God. Thanks be unto God. Thanks be unto God. I want you to pray right now. Let the Holy Ghost pray to you. Pray right where you are. Pray right there in your room, in your house. Maybe you're in a congregation together. Pray. Just open your mouth and pray right now. Let the Spirit carry out His ministry in your life right now. La baka robo seteke. Libra la mundo gosia. Baleke so shatarama. Segra te la bando gosi la baha. So jaloro mundo so. Pa ke la ronde se. Si karaba ba 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 de 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 so
barque de povo se perder o mundo. A chaca para catar a machaca. 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 Para 
I just want to talk to you if you've not been born again if you've not been living for Jesus Christ it's time to receive salvation a short while ago you heard Dr. Mike Smalley when he was talking about several individuals who received salvation Something would have come through your mind. But it's time for you to begin living your life for Jesus Christ. So if you want to receive this salvation now, you want to receive eternal life, you want to be born again, then you should. This is the moment. I want to lead you into salvation the Bible way. 
Say these words after me and mean them from the bottom of your heart. And God will hear you. Say, O oh Lord God, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe he died on the cross to save my soul. I believe God raised him from the dead and he's alive today. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord of my life from this day. I receive by faith eternal life into my heart thank you Lord for saving my soul I have eternal life now I am born again I'm a child of God from this day amen I want to pray for you father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ I pray for everyone who has just received this eternal salvation let the name of the Lord Jesus be named upon them from this moment. Satan has no claims over them anymore. They belong in your kingdom now. They belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. I bless them with your love, with your grace, with your word, with the Holy Ghost. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You are blessed now. You're blessed today. And I thank God for you. Would like to send you a special gift. It's a little book. You can easily read through it in a short time. It's titled, Now That You Are Born Again. It will tell you more about this life that you just received. And you can begin building your faith strong in Christ Jesus. Use the code number at the bottom of your screen, 4763. Go to the website. It bears the name of the book now that you are born again.org and get the book for yourself today do it today god bless you thank you lord hallelujah you may be seated please <clears throat> you know i have with us here today Dr. John Avanzini. Thank you. And I, I said to him that I, I want us to, to talk a bit about his books, and here's why. When I first met him, he said something to me. He said, uh, have we met before? I said, yes, I met you through your books. Yeah, and I was right. See, I read your books before I met you face to face. But they were not like any other books out there. They changed my life, my thinking about what you call, I didn't call it so then, biblical economics. That's the best way to describe it. See, because... That's what it brought me into, an understanding of God's economy. See, he has a kingdom. He has a kingdom. God has a kingdom of which we are now a part. Yes. See, we are praying. When we say the global day of prayer, we're praying. And the, the reasons why we pray. And the number one reason, of course, is that God asked us to pray because he intended to answer. But then we live in this kingdom in this economy of God that not many of God's people have yet understood. See, but today I have one who, I, I don't know, um, maybe you've heard some others, I don't know, but the one that I know has an effective ministry on biblical economics, as far as it's worked on my own life, and I present this to you, is right here 
with us, Dr. John Avanzini. You're yes. welcome, sir. Thank you, my friend. 88. 88. 88 years old. Yes, sir. Wow. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, sir. It's an honor to have you here. It is wonderful. Talk to us about your books. Why did you write these books? And each one of them with a special title. Tell us what they're about. And by the way, you will be able to get these books. They'll change your life. Can we have a, you got a, a list of these books? Yes, sir. I, I have several here. The yes. one I think that was the, uh, one that's probably went the furthest through the earth is 30, 60, 100 fold. 30, 60, 100 fold. I don't know, can we see a cover of it or do we have it on? Oh, has it come online there? 30, 60, 100 fold. I, um, this was the, the, the laws of, uh, pretty much have to do with uh, the harvest, how to release the harvest. And I have the table of contents here. One of the great things in this, in this book that really touches people is that I tell here the story about Abba, Nigeria. When God came into my room and started to speak to me, I was, I was, I was embarrassed when I was in Abba. I came to a great meeting with Dr. Cirillo. And as I walked in that door, the power that was, was in that Abba room. This in Nigeria. Can yes, you imagine Abba. that? So God is everywhere, you Amen. see. Amen. Crystal Park Hotel in Abba, Nigeria. I don't know the room number, but I, I remember very well the color of the curtains and everything. But in that, when I came in that meeting, I, I, you know, I always had information. I, I've, I've, since the day that I started preaching, I've been looking for information, looking for information. So, but I came in that room. And there were men preaching with n not nearly the information that I have, but with a power, a power. And I, I got up to speak, and for the first time, I just really realized something is totally missing in me. And I, I, got, I got before the Lord that night. In the, and you know, I love your country because at night you can see the stars. My country is so full of light, you can't see the stars. <laughs> but anyway... I, I'm just praying and praying, and, and, and the first night, uh, I went through the entire night, no sleep. The next day, went into the church preach, and I preached again with no power. But the third night, the third night, as I it was at the window, you know, I can look into some lights, and I want to look away. This light drew me into it, and then a voice of God began to speak to me. He told me, he said, John, I don't want my people to be poor. I don't want my people to do without. And he says, but we, and I can't tell you how he talked to me, whether it was in some kind of infusion or words, but these things were just happening in me. And it was, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want fundraising. I want the finance message to go forth and change the lives of the people. And I wrote a book, Rich God, Poor God. And in that book, God's got plenty of money. He's not looking for money. But he'd like for his people to have more money. You know, I, I, I have a... Uh, he, sh he showed me in my... In, in that night, he said, uh, it would be almost like a crime for a rich father to wish that he had poor children. It would just be... It would just be totally out of focus with truth. And as he spoke on to me further... Bits of information started coming. The next time I spoke in the meeting, I spoke with more authority, much more authority. I had something new in me. But it was the beginning of something. It was the beginning of something. Then, as uh, Dr. Paul Crouch with Trinity Broadcasting, uh, uh, and an interesting story, just a minute to tell it. I had got the first message on biblical economics I was going to preach I was in El Cajon, California, suburb of San Diego, and I wanted an ad in the paper. And I was, I was going to preach three nights on God's best friend was a multimillionaire. I was going to preach on, on Abraham. And uh, so when I got there, the man that was running the paper, he said, you know, that man that used to be the associate of your, of your church, he's now upset with you. He's in the other room bringing some kind of a bad report against you with one of my other reporters. And I, and I said, he's, he's referring to a problem that happened in Denver. And I said, can I get the district attorney on the phone with you? 
and let him talk to you? He said, oh, I'd love that. I th- he could see a story coming. But uh, Floyd Marks, district attorney of Adams County, he, he said Dr. Avanzini was in business with these people. He did nothing wrong. That's totally exonerated. Those men right now are, are serving time. And uh, he said, I'm going to put you on the front page. He said, I'm, I'm going to put a picture of you on the front page and uh, tell your story about what happened in Denver in, in, uh, that you were exonerated and that you're going to preach on biblical economics. And that was so, it was so nice to my heart. But three weeks later, Paul Crouch calls and he says, somebody sent me the front page of that paper. And he said, will you come tell us about God's best friend was a multimillionaire. And from that day on for 26 years, five times a day, free, free, never paid. I was on the air all that time, absolutely free teaching biblical economics. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it drove me to expand on the subject because I I had to have 20 messages a week. And so with the 20 messages a week, I was continuously in the book and then books started peeling off. Books started coming forth, different thoughts like, like this one, uh, the laws of the harvest. And, and it was so simple. And, and I, uh, I was in Kansas one time, right in the middle of a wheat belt where everybody in the room was a wheat farmer and uh, are associated with that. And I'm with God. I have my message ready, I think. And God says, I want you to preach on the laws of the harvest. I said, Lord, these are farmers. He said, the laws of the harvest. So I started with the laws of the harvest, and it must have been like, what kind of an idiot do we have here telling us this? He said, uh, the laws of the harvest, number one, you have, to, you have to sow what you want to reap. And then you have to, and it was going on. But then I hit one point, one point. I, I said, the eighth law of the harvest, you must always sow to your harvest size and not from your harvest size. And a gasp went through the room. And I couldn't get out of the building that night as he came and said, John, that's exactly what a farmer does, but it is not what we do with the heart. When we give to God, we're not giving to what we want to have. We're giving from what we got. And so I said, oh, I just did. I felt like an idiot talking to these great wheat farmers and men that had grown up with the soil and I'd never planted a thing. But uh, here they were telling me, how powerful what I said had been. But it didn't come from me because I had no knowledge of it. God put it in my heart. Then I had another book that I wrote, Moving the Hand of God, Putting Memorial Prayer to Work. And that goes over to that 10th chapter of Acts when Cornelius was called upon by uh, Simon Peter, asked Simon Peter to come. But the strong thing there is what did, why did God pick, why did God pick Cornelius, I'm in a, a Roman sentry, might have been a man with blood on his hands. But he picks him, and uh, the reason he gives is you have been such a giver, and you've mixed your giving and your praying together, and it's become something bigger than giving. It's become bigger than praying. It's become a memorial that stands before God and cries out the decree of what it is that you want from me. And it, 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 the book just went everywhere, powerful move. And memorial prayer was taught for so many, many places. Then the one, and, and this is a, one, uh, a gentleman just in the next nation, Dag uh, Mills, Dag Mills, his favorite book, he says, it's not working, Brother John. <laughs> it's not working, Brother John. And in this book, I have 25 things that just absolutely, children of God would come to me at the end of a service and say, Brother John, it's not working. I've been, I've been trying to do what you're saying. It's not working for me. Well, I had 25 things from not tithing. Down, but then one of them that no one ever thinks about, wrong marital relations. A husband and a wife not getting along with each other will hinder their prayers, will absolutely hinder their prayers. So one of the things that Pat and I had to do, we had to find another way to solve our problems than arguing about them. And, and another story. But anyway, it was, drove us to that. And, I, and most people don't see that. They'll be, 
they'll maybe be rough with their wife, or there maybe will be the wife will maybe uh, be talking about the business of the house when she wouldn't be uh, with neighbors and things that she shouldn't be. But there has to be that harmony. There has to be that one heart. Like when Sister Pat passed, half of me died. Half of me died. We had become one flesh. And I'm telling you, the scriptures talk about the the the, the harvester overtaking the, the the sower. It's happened in our life. And I thought many of the seeds that I planted, I was always thinking I was planting annuals. But in the middle of all of that, there were perennials. They were coming up again. Every year they came up, they seeded themselves. And then in the last years now in my life, uh, last 10, 15 years, apple trees, orange trees, with mammoth amounts of fruit coming into my life, coming into my life. But it was one of those things that it's not working, Brother John. But you'll, if it's not working for you, you'll find something in that book that will help you get online with it. And then probably one of the most powerful thing that I've ever put together, and it's unique. Uh, it's called Steward Tips. And the thing that it makes me know it's unique, you can't find it on the Internet anywhere. Once a person has it, they never release it. It's a powerful book. But what it is, it's, it's 156 offertory sermons for a pastor to use in teaching his people. Now, here's the drill most pastors will go through the week. They will diligently study, prepare. But then in the last minute, they scratch through the book, which is going to be the offertory. And they'll get up and they'll say, John 3, uh, uh, Luke 6, 38. Ten minutes and talk to your people about this glorious part of their uh, salvation, which is uh, having the the comforts that the family needs, having the wherewithal to uh, seed the gospel that you're a steward. And until you move into that steward position, you're going to just be sitting around wondering what everybody's up to. But stewards are not owners. Stewards are managers for an owner, and. Um, Stewards are, re- are owners. They're rewarded. Uh, stewards are faithful. First day, just easy little thing, but it's taught. Then the next uh, week, God wants you to prosper. Part one, God wants you to prosper. Part two, God wants you to prosper. Part three. So every three weeks, there's the thought goes through people's minds, and um, there's 156 of these. There's one for every Sunday morning every Sunday night, and every midweek service. And that has just absolutely revolutionized uh, those that use it. Uh, I have churches that are totally, absolutely debt-free, mammoth buildings paid for. Uh, One building, the the, the Holy Stadium in uh, in, uh, Simarang, Indonesia. I taught there for several years, and in one offering... This is almost unbelievable. In one offering, they brought forth 27 U.S. million dollars and paid for the building. No other offering had to be taken. But there's a people that know how to take and bring forth the abundance that God promises. Because like I've said, even from this wonderful pulpit, I've said that this book is about wealthy people. This, this book is about millionaires and billionaires and the richest king in the world and the wisest man and, and all these powerful things. Uh, David giving in the, the tons of gold he's giving. And we some way have turned that into poverty. And like the Bible says, your traditions make the word of God of no effect. And it's not ceremonial traditions. You can burn incense if somebody will tell you about Jesus, you can get saved. But it's the traditional interpretation of the word. He said, you've made this Corbin. And we take these and these doctrines come forth. And I just thank God that we're in a day now that people like yourself and others around the world have picked this up. Because when I started uh, that day in Abba, I came out and I thought I need to buy books on finance. And I went out, there were no books on finance. A few little books on tithing that later I found out was 
just people's mind instead of what the word said. But God started giving me line upon line, precept upon precept. And like my preaching, the books are statement, word of God, statement, word of God, statement, word of God. And uh, my opinions didn't do this. It's not a work of a man. But God has done it. And then I, let me, let me see, I had another sheet there. Oh, here it is. I just quickly touch on a couple of other books. One of them that I really, and I, uh, there's a book that I wrote on the defeated foe. The defeated foe. And I take uh, John 10.10. 10. And uh, in there, you know, we, we just taught that, that John 10.10 10 is the devil. It's taught everywhere that thief has come but to steal, kill, and destroy. And, uh, you know, that gives power to the devil if you take and give him, if you give him assets that he doesn't have. But when you, when you read that, you'll come to find that it's not talking about the devil. It's talking about hireling shepherds, hireling shepherds. And then, Jay, read this one verse if you can put it up for me here. Uh, Hebrews 2.14 2.14. Can you read that, please? Yes. Hebrews J- J- Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 14 no. says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. He can't kill you. He, now, they used to be fearful of that through all the Old Testament. We don't have to be afraid of that. He cannot kill you. He's a defeated foe. What's left now is to put him under the feet of Jesus. He said, I want him as my my footstool. I want him as my footstool. And uh, book after book that God let me write, the seven, uh, just not only on finance, but a couple of different. One of them that was powerful was the, the seven deadly fears. The seven deadly fears. The fear of man. The fear of insufficiency, the fear of failure, the fear of the unknown. These things just stop men in their tracks. But the books are all over the Internet. Uh, uh, I have no longer store them. I no longer distribute them. They're, uh, the steward tips, I just uh, I would encourage people to press in to try to get that because every, every, every pastor needs that. But I just thank God for this opportunity, this late part of my life, that I'm having this renaissance, and you've been a part of it. You've been a great part of it, you and your beautiful people. And uh, uh, I, I just thank God that uh, you, as long as you come up to the, to, the, to the plate, like baseball, he'll pitch you a ball. And if you don't hit it, he'll pitch you another one. And after three strikes, he'll pitch you more till you get a hit. And I love this God of mine that let me do this. And I love you for letting me be a part of what happens in this great end time harvest. Amen. Thank you, sir. In the last few days, you you were sharing with us uh, along these lines, and you dealt with several related topics. Now, our global audience are waiting in the spirit of prayer, talk to us how they journey from where they are to where each one ought to be. Well, I think when it comes to, like any part of your life, when it comes to the finances, and you pray about that, if you're praying about need, if you're You know, God is not, he's just not moved by need. If he was moved by need now, he would have not got it all done at the cross. Say that again. I want him to hear it. God is not moved by need today. If he was moved by need today, he would be confessing that he didn't do enough at Calvary. Did you you hear that? See, Because sometimes there are people who think that God should see their situation and see their need. You have to hear that again. Hear that one more time. That God is not moved by your need. That's news to some people because they think God sees everything. He knows my need. He knows your need. He's not moved by your need. 
Go ahead, He's sir. moved by faith in his answer to your needs. Oh. He's moved by faith in your answer to his needs. It's not like your need hasn't been met. Your need has been met, but you have to go and pick it up. You have to yeah. pick it up. Uh, I, I, I know people as a pastor for 27 years that did everything for their children and ruined them. Ruined them. And then others that were there, if they were falling, that they'd catch them, but that they would continuously to do themselves. Uh, Jay, Jay, my, my daughter-in-law, Jay's mother, when something's broken, she fixes it. And you say, the washing machine one day, Tony comes home and it's all across the whole counter. She's putting the washing machine back together. But it all started with her dad. When her dad, she brought her record player into her dad and said, it's not working. And he said, well, go back and fix it. So she stayed days with that thing and finally figured out that there needed to be a little more pressure on the top of it. She put a quarter on top of it, taped it to it, and it went to working. But she, from that day on, has just gone ahead and worked things out. And if, you, if God's going to raise responsible children, they have to see about the method that God has for meeting a need and meeting it. You, you, you follow? So when you pray... After you, you've, you've planted a seed, you've done what you need to do, you need to, uh, you don't go dig it up like, like uh, James said yesterday, I think. You don't go dig it up and see how it's doing. You have to believe that it's so. And that is hard to do. That sometimes is very hard to do. But it just takes discipline that, God, you've said it. I've done it. I've sowed the seed. I will have the harvest. I'm watering it. I'm living right. I'm doing the things that need to be done, and this will come to pass. Hallelujah. And as, as, as persistence was so good, and then expectation. I'm telling you, if that's not one of the greatest powers that we have is expectation. Expectation that it is going to happen. Well, how do you, I'm just, it's going to happen. Well, well, what if it doesn't happen? Well, it's not going to not happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And that expectation mm -hmm. Is a, is great part of the harvest, because that farmer, he's expecting, he's expecting that thing to happen, even to the point that if it doesn't happen, he's out. He doesn't get three or four times in a year. He's got one time for that thing to happen. But we have time and again. But I'm I'm, I'm saying, just focus on the fact that what has been promised has been done. Yes. God's not creating new things. All, here's, here's a great verse. Uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. What things is he saying? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. He says, I'll take it away from that bunch, and I'll give it to you. The wealth <laughs> of the wicked is laid up for the just. He's not making new ones. He's not making new ones. It's no. just wealth transfer. Yes, and, yes, yes, wealth transfer, yeah. That's amazing. And I, I remember... I, I, you know, we need a new car, need a new car. John, they're, they're, they're pouring them off the assembly line every day. There's cars everywhere. The, the car dealers don't know what to do with them. There's so many of them. But uh, I, I don't have a car. Well, I have, what model do you want? Well, get focused on one, get focused on it, and get the seed in the ground and start believing me for it and start treating the car you have right. Now, in America, I don't know, the hamburgers come in boxes here. Say that again. Start treating the car you have right. You have to treat the car right. Because I've had people say, well, I believe in God for a, for a, a BMW. I believe in God. And I said, are you prepared for a BMW? I said, you can't have hamburger boxes up to your ankles in a BMW. You can't have it smelling like French fries. I said, you have to go into training for a BMW. And you have to believe God. And the same thing for if you're going to have a beautiful home. You know, people will have pictures of this palatial house. And I say, honey, do you have any idea how much the curtains cost for that house? Let's get you started in a house that you can afford the curtains for. And then God will move you to the next one. You know, and here's, here's a powerful thing. God says that he gives us seed, multiplies our seed for sowing, and he adds to our assets. Most believers, now hear me, this is a great mistake that I know if you not, haven't made it, you're getting ready to make it, is as the, as the prosperity comes, 
you start multiplying assets and adding to your sowing. God says that's not the way it's to be done. You're supposed to multiply your seed, and as it comes, that seed is multiplied for sowing. And things then are added, not multiplied. Because I watch people when the prosperity first comes, new car, new house, new this, new that, furniture, and the first thing you know, there's no seed going back in the ground. Mm -hmm. A part of every harvest is yours to keep. A part of your, every harvest belongs to God. But a part of every harvest is for sowing again. And again, because here's what. You don't just need enough for your need. If you are praying for enough, you're not praying for enough because you've got to just feed yours, but you've got to feed the hungry. You've not just got to clothe yours, but you've got to clothe the naked. All these, and you have to see that a portion is there for those that nothing is provided. The world is full of people that nothing's been provided for them. They're totally destitute and something has to be for them. So we have to, we have to get that in our mind that whenever we, uh, whenever we come into abundance, that we understand where it came from and how to keep it going, how to have it happen again. And then also God says this, are you wanting to be a good man or a good woman? How many here want to be a good man or a good woman? Sure. Well, think about this. It says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, not just my children. And how many, how many Christians, their family has to uh, take an offering at, a, at the end to get them buried? And in my nation now, there's so little money among Christians that cremation now is the big thing in Christianity now. Everybody, a lot of people getting cremated. Why? Because they can't afford a funeral. It's a cheap way to get rid of a body. But God says, I want your, listen, I want, yes, he wants weeping at your wake. But then after that, he wants shouting and jumping and hollering. Do you know what Pop Pop left me? Pop Pop left me that car that he drives. And Pop Pop left me that piece of land out there. And Pop Pop left money in the bank for me. Oh, God wants us to be prosperous so that we can bring forth the prosperity to others by sowing into the gospel. Oh, wow. He said something very important. I hope you didn't miss that. He said, when God blesses you, you receive. He says, a part of it belongs to you, which you can consume or use, whatever. A part of it, he says, belongs to God. And then he says, another part is for sowing. Sowing. Now, there's a difference between the part that is for sowing and the part that belongs to God. Yes, yes. You can't sow the one that belongs to God no. because it belongs to God. It belongs to God. You see it? For example, your first fruit belongs to God. Your tithe belongs to God. Yes. It's not part of what you sowed. No. See? Because sometimes there are people who make mistakes. They think, well, um, I gave a tithe. No. You can't give your tithe to the poor, for example. No. You can't give your tithe to the poor. Mm. There's a definiteness in God's word as to where to give your tithe. Yes. See? You're giving your tithe in the house of God mm. where you are feeding the word of God. Yes. Where God's word is given to you. Yes. That's so where you give your tithe. Because there is where you meet the truth of God. Mm. See? He tells you that the house of God, the church of God, is the pillar and the ground of yes, truth. Yes, yes, yes. That's very important. Then you sow your seeds, and that is in various forms. The various ways to sow seeds. But don't confuse the two. Mm. Don't confuse them. You, you know, there's something there in what you're saying. Malachi 3, 8, I believe it, it says, you robbed me in tithes and offerings. Mm -hmm. You've robbed me in tithes and offerings. Well, we understand the tithe is a robbery, but where's the robbery of the offering? That the belongs, offerings. That belongs I, to us. That's, in fact, <laughs> a lot of people don't realize that they must give God offerings. Mm -hmm. yes. He may not be specific as in the tithe, 
as to how much you give in your offering, but it can give you a spiritual guidance for you yes. as an individual or even your family. Yes. But he expects you to give him offerings. Right. Offerings belong to God. You, you have to. Uh, Dr. Avanzini, there was a, a scripture. I want you to talk about it. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. Mm -hmm. That's yes, sir. I want you to, to uh, explain it to them. I, I have, uh, in our nation, a very fine man, one of my closest friends, came up. All of a sudden, he comes up with a tithing is not for the church. Very prominent man, and a good man, a very good man. But um, so God has stirred me that I have to write a book about the tithe. I thought I was through writing books. And so I went into a study on the tithe and if you're going to deal with the tithe and if you're going to come in any opposition with the teaching of the church today, they're teaching that it started in the law and starting in the law that when the law was over, the tithing was over. And then some take it back to, to Abraham. And then when you follow most theologians, they teach that the tithe was uh, taken from the Mesopotamians and that it was kind of plagiarized into the, into the gospel. And I searched, and, and Jay and I together have searched and searched and searched. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I came up, uh, uh, Lansdowne, I think his name is, mentioned the Septuagint. And I thought back, Septuagint, I've heard that. Yeah, this, it's one of the translations. But then I got to looking at that Septuagint. And for 700 years, it was the only Bible the church had. The only one. But somewhere down the line, the devil has got it there where they made a little switch. And all of a sudden, we're on to a, what they call the Masoretic text, which was the text that the, that the Jews put together for the purpose that, 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 that Isaiah 7.14 would not be so easy to lead Jews to the Lord. So they changed it. A young woman has, has conceived and, uh, but anyway, in that Masoretic, in the uh, Septuagint, yes. which is for, for a thousand years, it was the only text of the, interp of the translation of the Hebrew into Greek. And now, as I, so anything that's changed from the, Mas from the Septuagint has been changed by someone because it started as the first translation. Now, in, in, in Genesis 4, and uh, seven, and uh, it's 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 it, it it speaks there about. Do you have that? Yes, sir. He, he has a Septuagint text. Yes, sir. You can read it first from from the King James, so they get what you're what you're reading. Okay. And if you can turn on the the Septuagint after this, we'll appreciate it. Otherwise, we'll read it from here. Uh, the the fourth chapter, yes. probably can just go seven from, verses. Okay, go from yeah. I'll go from the, just top. Read the top. So. The, from Genesis 4, uh, verse 1. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt, shall thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, Sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, this verse is totally different, just opposite of what the Septuagint says. The first translation of the original says this. This is in verse Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. Hast thou not sinned? If thou hast brought it rightly, listen, but, but not rightly divided, divided it. it. You did not fractionalize it properly. Mm. 
you kept the wrong fraction of it for yourself and did not give me the proper fraction that I had coming. One tenth of it was mine. That's the first, that's the first translation. Everything else, that, anything that disagrees with it has changed that first translation. The Septuagint. Powerful piece of information. It really resets the whole bounds that the tithe started the first man born of a woman. The first man ever born of a woman was Abel. Because the others were created and formed. Now watch. That man was told, you can straighten this thing out with me, son, if you'll just divide it right. If you'll just get the fraction right, you'll fractionalize it right. Anything that's divided gets fractionalized. He said, you did not fractionalize it right. And then he says, and then Satan will be in submission to you. But the King James says just the opposite. So we don't have to go look for the, the law was, came with the law. It didn't come with the law. It was the very first thing that God ever spoke any time that an offering came. And I'm sure that he spoke it to Adam and Eve and that they shared it with Cain and Abel. And Abel did not decide to fractionalize properly. He may have given him 1% or 2% or 5%. But the 10% from the very beginning, the first man ever born of a woman, understood that the tithe is the Lord's. Wow. That's amazing. It's a powerful thing. Yeah. You know, one quick other thing real, as we're talking yes, here. Sir. You know when it says, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings? That robbery in the offering, here's the bottom line of it. You've robbed me of the ability to bless you. <laughs> that when you take that offering, when you don't give that offering, okay, you're clear with the tithe, you did the tithe, but you now have another robbery. What you've done is you've robbed your father. You've robbed your father of being able to bless you. Are, are you picking that up? That's a, that's a powerful piece of information. Wonderful. And the tithe and the offering, and, and it just keeps going. It keeps multiplying. And um, sometimes there's little setbacks, but that's why it comes forth 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Because every once in a while, somebody's supposed to do something, and they don't do it. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, what you're supposed to have in your hand from God is not there. But there's way more than enough from the last time. 60, 100-fold. And 100-fold, I just quickly say this. Is it 100 times? It is this. It's optimum yield. It's optimum yield is what it means. The most possible under the circumstances. Amen. Wow. Thank you, sir. We are more grateful. Thank you so much, sir. It's wonderful. Wonderful. What is it like for you to hear a man of God who's been on this for so many, many years? Many of us were kids. Yes. And when he went to a bar that he was talking about, I don't, I, I don't even know where I was. <laughs> so, <laughs> see, but the Lord has kept him these many years so we can benefit from the amazing revelations of God's word granted him on biblical economics. Don't forget what I said, because God's kingdom is an economy. Yes, it is. See, and he tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, when you read from verse 8 to verse 10, he tells us about the administration of this economy. We have to be involved in it. And if you don't understand it correctly, you'll be like Cain, who didn't rightly divide. Mm. And by not rightly dividing, then you find your life is going in the wrong direction even though you're praying because there are practical things to be done. And when you do them, your life will be positioned correctly. Amen. Glory be to God. Thank you so much, sir. Amen. Thank you, sir. Can you now pray for God's people? Pray for them all over the world. Their hearts be directed, directed in walking in the light as he is in the light. Amen. God, I thank you that clarity comes in so many areas as revelation comes to your children, to your leaders, to pastors, to prophets, and we begin to understand 
that you want to bless us. You want us to have exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. God, we thank you that you have a clear plan, a clear plan on how to do that. The tithe, the offering, and you understand, we understand it's seed, God. Even in Genesis 9, verse 6, second, second, excuse me, second Corinthians 9, 6 on, it tells us clearly that your money into the gospel is seed and it has harvest power, just like an apple seed has it. Money into the kingdom of God, Lord, has harvest power. It can come back 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. God, touch your children across the world and let them understand that we are in a kingdom and a kingdom has government. And in government, there are rules. And one of the rules, the income from the kingdom comes through the tithe into the kingdom and the income and the increase in our life. Lord, let us see that clearly comes through our offerings. And if we sow sparingly, we reap sparingly. And if we sow bountifully, we reap bountifully. And I ask you, Lord, that there can be a shift, a shift in the thinking of the real people of God and that they can understand something has been taken from us. This teaching against tithing, Lord, that they would understand, even as we learn to pray to stop things, that we can stop this in its tracks and that the children of God all across the world can have the benefit of the tithe, the benefit of the offering, and the benefit of seed time and harvest. I thank you, God, that you've let me work in this corner of the vineyard. And Lord, that we see you bring forth for everyone that believes what your Bible says about giving and receiving, it comes back to them 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. And we speak, God, that in the house of God, there will be more than enough. And the wealth of the wicked, there's an end-time wealth transfer. You said wicked men would go and weep and howl in the last days. We ask that the weeping and the howling begins as they loose that money that they're hoarding, that is rusting in their hands. And it comes into our hands where we can feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and we don't have to slaughter a part of the population to try to make the planet last, but there'll be more than enough. It'll be a garden that'll bloom across the entire globe, places that now they think are deserts. We know, we see it in Israel, deserts can be turned into gardens when God's people have a hold of it. And we speak it's done in the powerful, strong name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Be blessed. Amen. Glory be to God. Dr. Avanzini, thank you very, very much. You know, I said to him, I said, I would like us to talk about your books. See? And uh, the reason being that I, I, wanted, I wanted you to be aware of the information. Information can change your life. See, in the prayer that he just prayed, he said something that was very, very important. Comparing those who say they want to save the planet by killing people. See, they think the poor should be killed. Compare that with those who want to save the people with solutions. Satan's ideas are not good. They lead to death. So when you see those people, can you imagine in that class where, where, where Bill Gates was giving the formula, there were actually people in there when he gave the formula and they were clapping. They clapped when he said that the P has to go down. The P, which is the P for population, that had to go closer to zero. And they clapped like they lost their minds for the moment. They didn't know who was talking about them. <laughs> it was about them. They're going to, oh dear. Oh dear. Glory be to God. Lift your hands and just thank the Lord and glorify Him. Glorify Him. Honor Him. 
honor him. Most worthy King of Kings, honor the Lord. Sing to honor the Lord. Sarabakonda la garaba city kirabaha.
Kapurasanda Karabaka Sande de Gebrosia Lipa Karabakon de Lebrosete Kiraman de Gebrosia O Karabasande de Gebrosi Karaman de Days. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to God. We're going to pray the next several minutes. It's just going to open your mouth in prayer. You know, he said, my house shall be called of all nations. House of prayer. house of prayer wherever you are right now let's get into prayer let's get into prayer let's pray let's pray
Thank you, Lord, for all your children all over the world. Thank you. Thank you for this increased grace. Thank you. Thank you for divine favor throughout the world, in all nations, for your people. Divine favor. The walking in divine favor in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everywhere they go, everywhere they are, divine favor in the name of the Lord Jesus. Governments and leaders will favor them. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Yes, the work in favor everywhere. The power of the Holy Ghost. 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 Thank you. Let the weak be made strong. In the name of the Lord Jesus. I pray for every child of God who's sick somewhere in the world maybe at home maybe in the hospital maybe there's some emergency some affliction that they're going through I rebuke the devil that caused it I rebuke that devil of darkness to come out of your body and get out of that situation that health wellness soundness may spring forth in the name of the Lord Jesus that God's people become healthy and strong I pray that courage be stirred up in your spirit faith of God will come to your spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus be made strong be made strong be made strong be made strong I pray for ministers of the gospel is there anyone who's been discouraged who's been tormented who's been persecuted And at the point of discouragement or giving up, giving up, Lord, I pray for that one. Pray, let the word come to their spirits. The ministry of the Holy Spirit at work right now, that they be comforted, encouraged, and strengthened. The power of the Holy Ghost. The power of the Holy Ghost. Manifest your grace in their situation, I pray. Manifest yourself in their situation. He said, roll the stone away. Roll the stone away. 
Let that stone now be rolled away in their lives in the name of the Lord Jesus. And there will be a change. There will be a change. There will be a change. A change. In their lives, in their families, in their ministry. A change. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Answers are coming to them now. Solutions are coming to them now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Sarabati Kesia. In Tequilo Bondo Saparabakati. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So Rabba Kasele Mandi Kosata. Kila Baraba Kunto So Brash Sato Kostedi. Kiso Rabandele Brokosidikis. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit of God. Kobo Sata Rabaka Sindi Kibo Robo City Kila Baha. God, thank you, Lord. <clears throat> and here's what the Spirit says. The hour is an hour of promotion and increase in the kingdom of God. It is a time of increase. Not only are your abilities multiplied, your results will be multiplied. Amen. And the Spirit of God says your efforts will be crowned with greater success Amen. than you have known. Because it's a time of increase. Therefore, increased favor shall be yours. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit of God.
There's a grace that's being released. <clears throat> and you see what he said to those. You know, when I read it earlier on, I was reading it for another purpose. What I'm seeing in the spirit is the picture. It's a picture. What I was reading to you earlier. In Isaiah chapter 14. The first. Can we read the first two verses? And probably it might get into the third one he says for the lord will have mercy on jacob and will yet choose israel and set them in their own land and the strangers shall be joined with them the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of jacob there are sinners who have run and even been Masters of many who believe in the Lord. Now the Lord is saying that they will cleave unto you. They will cleave unto you. They come to believe in the same God that you believe in. Look at the next verse. It says, and the people shall take them and bring them to their place. They're going to, they're going to help you. And bring you into your place of honor. They will help you. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord. They join you and they even serve you. Hallelujah. And where, where others have run over you and run you, now you become masters. You become leaders. The grace is moving you into positions of leadership. Hallelujah. Look at that last line. And they shall rule over their oppressors. He's saying that those who even oppress God's people. Will be ruled over by God's people. Hallelujah. They shall rule over their oppressors. This is the time. And, and the, the change is taking place. The change is taking place. And it's going to go from glory to glory, from glory to glory, from glory to glory. And this scripture, to different degrees, will be experienced by individuals and groups throughout the earth. By God's people. Hallelujah. Go! God's grace, God's grace, hallelujah. You remember what he said? He said, they spoil the Egyptians. God gave them favor before the Egyptians. God gave them, God gave them. He's still doing it. Yes, sir. God gave them. He gave them favor. He's given us favor, hallelujah. And you can, you can declare it and say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I walk in divine favor. I walk in divine favor. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I walk in absolute favor. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory. So favor shall overtake you. So favor is not only going with you where you're going, it overtakes you and waits yes, for sir. you there. Yes. Well, glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm walking in divine faith. Divine faith. 
divine favor, divine favor. Goodness and mercy shall follow me and favor shall overtake me. That's amazing. I know who I am. Goodness and mercy follow me. Favor overtakes me. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to God. I remember we have the Healing Streams TV and you can have the live programs, you can watch the live programs every Friday, Saturday and Sunday and also call in. You hear many calling in to share their amazing testimonies. You can do the same. It's on every day, but on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 4 p.m., it's live. So don't miss that. You enjoy it very much, and you'll be really, really blessed. And make sure also to watch our Rhapsody TV. You'll be amazed at the inspiring things, inspiring programming. And then I, I, I told you about our news programs. Next month, we're launching the news station, the national news station. <laughs> Next month is April. Yeah. It's going to be wonderful. There's some of you who are saying, I, I wish I could speak in tongues like all those people I'm seeing on television. I wish I could speak in tongues. I wish I could pray in the spirit like Pastor Chris said. I'm going to pray for you in a second. And that's going to happen with you. Just get ready. Just get ready. This is your moment. Get ready. And the April communion, global communion service will be 7th of, April, 7th of April, Sunday the 7th of April, 3 p.m. GMT plus 1. And the following Sunday, 14th of April, is a praise night, special praise night. And Wednesday... The 17th to Friday the 19th is your lover special. <laughs> Season 9, Phase 3. So get ready for that. Yes, Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I want to thank you all for being a part of this 17th edition of the Global Day of Prayer. Thank you very, very much. And special appreciation to Dr. John Avanzini. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. You've been a great blessing to us, especially to me. I'm thankful. Thankful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, Jason, his grandson, and... His wife, Jessica, both here. They've been quiet all night. But he's a marvelous preacher of the gospel. And you can imagine, he shares the same message with grandpa. Biblical economics. 
And if you listen to him, you think you're listening to Dr. John himself. Wow, really, wow. really. I thank God for you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank God for you. We love you, Pastor. I'm sure they like to hear your voice. <laughs> come say hello to everybody. Come, come, come. Shut a microphone. Great. Come say hello to everybody. Just say whatever God puts in your heart. You start. Okay. <laughs> what a what I'll a give you time to, to decide what you're going to say. <laughs> what an absolutely powerful time this has been. Um, I'm so blessed to get to be a part of Love World. We're so blessed to get to be here. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris. Um, it's impossible to, to be here to be a part of the Global Day of Prayer and not be transformed and not have a change in your perspective and not have a change in, of uh, perspective on who you are. Um, something that popped into my heart, Pastor, uh, familiar verse is uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. And in the King James, it says, return your tithes or bring meat into the storehouse. Here it is. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. Prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. What I think is important that's often overlooked is that it says, I will open you the windows of heaven. That the windows of heaven is not just something that happens to us, but it's something that happens through us. That you are the windows of heaven. That whenever someone wants to see what does heaven look like, they look right at you. And it's through you that blessings will come, that there is a blessing upon your life. But you are also the window of heaven. And as you begin to see heaven open over your life, may it continue to transform and shine light on all those that are around you. Glory be to God. Wow. I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's powerful. Um, such, such a privilege to be here. Thank you, Pastor. Turn on that mic. Okay. Hello? Okay. I'm just thankful to be here. This is such a privilege. Thank you, Pastor, for letting us be here, for letting us be the part of Love World. Being here just, it's just mind-blowing. I, I don't know what to say. It's, it's just, it's like a picture of the kingdom of God. I'm just, for the last uh, few days um, being here, I'm just excited for all the testimonies that's going to come, all the breakthroughs that's going to happen. Amen. Yes, praise God. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love you. God bless you. Love you. God bless you. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, this is Love World. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for praying with us everywhere in the world. And thanks again to all the ministers of the gospel who share the word of God with us since yesterday and prayed with us. Thank you. We come to the closing moments of this great service. And we cannot end the service without us giving everyone an opportunity to give an offering, a special offering to the Lord today. You have to always prepare yourself to give an offering to the Lord. We talked about that today. And it's part of dividing rightly. See, you have to have your offerings for God. It's important. He is not man. He is not a man. One of the ways you express that difference is through your offering. So we have some details on the screen that you can use. And find the one that's best for you. And if you're not immediately in the position where you can do it, take a picture of these details with your phone. And then, even long after we've closed, you can use those details to give your offering. can use those details to give your offering. 
So when we do a song, you'll be ready to give your offering. Glory be to God. I want to announce the song because um, we will also be closing this great service with that song. Now, first, you that are waiting to receive the Holy Spirit, I'm going to pray for you. It's a simple prayer. What will follow is you receive the Holy Spirit just in the same simple way that you received Christ to be Lord of your life. You receive the Holy Spirit and then something more will happen. From within you will come words of the Spirit. And you find yourself speaking in tongues. It says, open your mouth and I'll fill it. Yes, the Spirit of God will give you a prayer language, a spiritual language. And you begin to pray in the Spirit. So wherever you are right now, just lift your hands. Lift your hands as we all pray. And everyone just pray for those who have not yet received the Holy Spirit, who want to receive the Holy Spirit right now. And right there where you are, you say, Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I receive the Holy Spirit to live in me. You say those words. I receive the Holy Spirit to live in me. And thank him. Thank him. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive the Holy Ghost. Receive the Holy Spirit. Right there where you are. Receive the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit in the name of Jesus. Be filled with the Spirit in the name of Jesus. Be filled with the Spirit in the name of Jesus. Yes, it's happening right now. It's happening to you right now. It's happening to you right now. Be filled with the Spirit. Oh, glory to God. Oh, Yes, be filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That's already happened with you. And you don't stop. You just keep praying. Never stop. I see the glory.
Shatta Rabba Gabba Sisi 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 Sisi